So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for our breakfast briefing today, all about how can user experience and business analysis work well together. Um, my name is Chris Rourke, and you'll soon meet Sarah Williams, who's the other co-presenter uh, for this. And it's, uh, I hope you enjoy the, the talk. We're going to be sharing our experience, me more so talking about user experience, and Sarah with her background in business analysis and user experience. Uh, to, to tell you really our view of the situation as it's evolving in this area and what can be done to help these two important professions work well as best possible together. So that's the goal of the talk is to really to recognize the importance and benefits of a close relationship between UX and business analysis. They're both very important uh, parts of the modern business solution design environment. And um, I think it's in everyone's best interest if they work, work well uh, together. Just a few housekeeping things. Um, we've set it up so that you've all come in uh, on mute on this on the Zoom call. We're probably all fairly familiar with Zoom uh, these days. So you're all on mute by default. Take yourself off mute, if, especially if you want to ask a question towards the end. Um, we've also put you on no video, but you're more than welcome to put on your video. It's lovely to see a, a gallery of faces there as well uh, when we're talking to. So uh, feel free to, to do that. I'm gonna be recording this session because we're hoping to put this up on our YouTube channel as we did with a previous about a month ago uh, talk by Jerry McGovern and uh, sharing the slides as well. But your, your images won't be on any kind of recording that we make of this. Um, so the uh, this, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the, the talk and if you have any questions please feel free to put those into the chat area um what is probably easiest and best for us is we will we'll address those towards the end um rather than during the talk it can be a bit hectic uh, to be trying to do that while you're doing the talk so uh, we will get around to your questions and maybe we can do those verbally as well towards the end so just to get it get us started and a little bit more introduction to uh, myself and Sarah. Um, my name is Chris Rourke. I'm the uh, CEO and founder of UserVision. We're a leading user experience and service design consultancy based here in the, in the UK and I'm in Edinburgh, um, but we do work throughout Europe and quite a bit in the Middle East as well. And um, uh, I'll hand over to Sarah from Link Letters. Thanks, Chris. Um, so yeah, I'm Sarah Williams, and I've been working for over 10 years as a business analyst in the legal industry, with the last four years of that as a, in a hybrid business analysis, business analysis and usability analysis role. I've always got satisfaction from helping people and making their lives easier, usually through technology solutions. Um, so it's no surprise that following a website redesign project where I discovered my fascination with user research and user-centered design, I discovered another way to help people by doing what I love. I train in usability and user experience analysis to enhance my skills and enable me to practice in this area. Part of my role at Link Ladders is to shape and deliver the UX function in our firm with a view to develop UX maturity. Work will vary from expert reviews, vendor selection, change management recommendations of off-the-shelf applications, to influencing design of bespoke applications developed in-house for a variety of contexts. And lately, I've been assisting on the design planning for our new office, which we're building with the focus on user journeys and accessibility and inclusion. Part of this work includes a raising awareness through UCD through training for my colleagues and other key stakeholders in our firm, which is where user vision have been able to support us with on-site training. So I've been working quite closely with Chris in that space. I look forward to sharing some of my knowledge and experience and blending the two roles in our talk today. That's great. Thanks very much, Sarah. And that's us on Twitter, if you're into that sort of thing and tweeting. Um, yeah, and as Sarah mentioned, we have worked on some projects and sort of on the side chat in these projects. I've been so intrigued by the world of, of business analysis. And as I'll allude to, I've, I've been forming my view, what is business analysis since I first discovered it? And there's many aspects of the field I find very appealing. And I, I sometimes say that if I hadn't discovered the world of UX or as it was called back then, human computer interaction and engineering psychology way back when, I probably would have gravitated towards the world of business analysis because it shares um, some common traits of trying to pick apart uh, a, a situation, a problem, finding its elements and then coming up with a solution. So I think I have an affinity towards the world of BA as well even though it took me a while to figure out what it's all about. 
with a bit of help from Sarah as well. So here's what we're going to be talking about. The outline of today is why it's what's the challenge of the common ground, as I'll, I call it. And we'll just lay out a little bit of a definition of what is BA and, and UX, just to sort of position these two main entities, and then talk about how they're evolving, at least in our, our views. Um, and perhaps most importantly, ways that the two can actually work together towards the, the common good. So if we look at this by the common ground. What is this? The, what do I mean by the battle of the common ground? Sometimes projects can feel like this, um, where you got the the UX and user centric people, and I'll probably put myself on that team, pulling one end, and you got the business itself, and you know the serious people, the techies and the functional people, pulling the other end. I'm not sure if that resonates with you, but I know I've been on some projects where it's like that, and. You've probably been at the cutting edge of this type of thing. You know, we'd all like to think naively that, okay, businesses always think of users and they always try to design things to be great for users. And, you know, it's, you know, believe in all this kind of stuff and everything's all happy. I don't think the world is really like that. And you can probably think of your own examples where the, the intent of the, in the best interest of the business don't always lie in line with the best interest of the user. And, Think of your own examples. I, I think of things like if you're ever trying to find the phone number on a budget airline. Um, you know, users probably when they need to check something, they would love to just go onto the website saying, "Hey, what's their phone number? I want to call up someone and just check. You know, what you know if there's been a delay on my flight or something. That would be so good for the users if they could just call up, speak to someone really quickly, say, "Yeah, I need to check this thing or what's my baggage allowance on my flight? Thank you very much. Bye." That's the user's goal. Love to have that. What's the business goal? You know what? I'd rather not have to have too many people in the call center handling all those kinds of calls. And you know, that's why the fact is, good luck if you can actually find the um, you know the phone number for EasyJet or Ryanair or any of these. So there's quite a few. It's probably worth thinking about in your own company, in your own organization, if you have any of these things where they're pulling on the rope. If you look at that rope as the user, and they're both wanting the user to do different things, you know. It would be great if they could make it easy to call, call the call center. We don't want them to call the call center. So you can probably try to think in your own projects if you have any of these kinds of situations. And my perhaps one of the strongest ones and the one where I really started to understand or be introduced to the world of business analysis was one from, um, from a bank. This is many years ago. And they had a loan application. Um, and as part of that loan application, person would get through, they'd be asked for a loan of 5,000 pounds. Let's say they get that, uh, they get the award, they get the offer page where they say, yes, we'd be glad to lend you that money. Um, by the way, would you like to have uh, accident, sickness and unemployment insurance or what we came to be calling payment protection insurance with that loan? Um, you know, it, because you know, it could be really good in case you can't make the payments. And the user looking at their lovely award of the loan, they might say, no, I don't actually think I'm going to need that. Thank you very much. Expecting, let's just move on and close this off. Well, they say, no, thank you. On the next page, they get another reminder. Are you sure you don't want that payment protection insurance? It could be really good. You might lose your job. You might get sick. You might not be able to make all these payments back. You know, we really, you should. And the user says, no, I don't want that insurance. Thank you. And then what happens? The next page, they get another one that says, in very legal terms this time, saying, okay, we more or less understand you don't want that. Um, so please do take this. I hereby confirm that I will accept the risk of not making the payment and da, 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 all this kind of legalese kind of tone in it. And you had to tick it. And by the way, all of these, it was defaulted to, yes, I would like to have the your, your payment protection insurance. And I saw that and before even going to anything like usability testing, like, I said, hey, that's what's going on here. This isn't, this is quite a few bumps in the road for the user. I don't think this is going to be in their best interest. And I raised it to the powers that be in the in the organization. And I remember having a this this meeting with a business analyst who explained to me very clearly, well, Chris, you see, I know that's what the users would like, but you see, we make a lot of margin on these on this payment protection insurance stuff. And we, you know, really, we need to have this. And we've talked to the legal people. We've got the, the techies involved. And this is the way it's going to be. So just kind of accept it. And you know, I had to accept it. And unfortunately, you, you know, UX doesn't win all the battles, as many of you know. Um, and well, it, 
in the long run, it came back to, to bite them. I think many companies had payment protection insurance issues over the time. But that's where I started to, I was introduced to the world of BA because this was a business analyst who told me this. And I wasn't sure, what is a BA all about? What do they do? And I got the impression they seem to have almost like a shuttle diplomacy between what is the business wanting, what does the technology need to implement? And they have a very heady conversation that happens. And that's, that's, that's what started to form in my mind. What does a BA actually do in this world? And it's, uh, we can introduce this idea of, I'll call it a gulf of execution, sort of what a gulf between what the business wants and what the user may want. And this, uh, this idea is, is pretty fundamental. I think it justifies the whole role of user-centered design, which is what the UCD stands for, because they, the business might be talking about things that they want. We sell these products. This is the way we do it. We've always done it. Hey, let's make an app because everyone's got one. Um, our business is structured like this, so let's kind of reflect that in our solution or website or whatever. The designers, the developers, um, you know, the technology team, they might, they'll have their own drivers, you know, let's use this technology, this architecture, it's easier, it's cool if we do it this way. And there's a lot of conversation, often through the channels of BAs, that can happen on the left side of that, uh, of that uh, gulf, in a way. There's uh, many websites that have, and probably still are, created by a heady conversation between the designers and the business uh, and the developers. And, uh, you know, Meanwhile, you could have the users over here saying, well, here's the way I prefer to buy and interpret and consider products. Uh, you know, here's the information I'd like to share, et cetera. And, you know, in its simplest way, that could be seen as a gulf of execution. And again, very simply, this is what the world of user research and user experience design is trying to do. We are trying to bridge that gulf, ideally earlier on in the process, so we start to learn from that stuff on the other side and inform the heady conversation that's happening on the other side of that of that gulf. So this is uh, it, this is the way that I, you know, still kind of see the world in a way, um, and that's a, a large part of the role that that we have in user experience um, and positioning it to to the business analyst. So let's have a quick look at a quick definition of what we think business analysis and user experience actually are briefly. So Sarah, you can talk about BAs. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, so it, it's gonna be very quick. Um, and while the BA role can take many forms and have many varied responsibilities in a very simplistic way and in no means attending to offend the BA masters I know that we have on this call, um, we could define it as follows. The ability to understand the business change needs and access the impact of those changes, which may include the development of new existing systems and solutions, improving processes to understand the as is and help shape, uh, shape or define the to be, strategic planning, both at the macro and micro level, organizational change and having sensitivity towards the fact that the recommendations and analysis that you make may influence uh, the organizational structure. Um, at, at my organization, we tend to have the definition referred to, because we're part of the technology function, um, that we often are the conduit between IT and business, facilitating and translating business requirements into a language understood, but with, with no ambiguity, and that's the tricky part, the no ambiguity, to the wider audience, including the delivery and test team. So making sure that all parties that are clear and straight on what they need to know and do. Um, to those of you who study business analysis, uh, you'll recognize this mnemonic pestle. I've selected this from the many BA analogies that we use to perform our analysis because it has a lot of similarities with the UX research. So I wanted to tie it in here. It also indicates quite nicely that the BAs don't just focus on the business itself when defining requirements, but also the environmental factors which impact it and its users. From the political standpoint, um, you may obviously have internal politics you have to deal with um, quite often and more so more impactful than others. But this more looks at the local or national government policies and initiatives. You know, and obviously a hot topic at the moment is the diversity inclusion movement. So that, you know, the business will want to be looking to be jumping on top of that and how they are reflecting those, um, those uh, politics and things at this stage. Um, at the economic side of things, so looking at sources of funding, but also you may consider the financial situation of the organisation itself and how the analysis or the external factors with regards to funding may be impacted by that. Social side of things, trends, changing tastes, changing behaviours, perceptions and social norms. We all know that social, social change can drive technology and the need for it. Equally, technology can drive social change in the way that we behave and interact with each other. So it's always 
good to be aware of what's going on at any point in time and potentially what's coming down the track as well. Technological side of things, this can definitely be um, looked at in a number of different ways, but often it pays to bear in mind that technology tends to have a shelf life of about two to five years before it needs to change. So whenever you are developing requirements or considering how you're going to maintain the systems, you need to consider the life lifespan of the technology, but also the way that it may be impacted by legal and social changes. From the legal side of things, this looks at compliance and business rules. Big obvious one across the board is GDPR. Um, similarly, you may have um, external influences like we have, which are contracts with our clients regarding how we store data securely. On so whether it's going to be cloud-based or on-prem can actually drive the way that we um, look at how we provide our solutions. But also there's one other directive such as the uh, web accessibility standards, which has come into play in the EU, where you have the um, you any any public sector facing a service or um, system must adhere to the accessibility web accessibility standards. Now, environmental side of things, uh, looking at the green issues such as reducing waste, recycling where you can, noise pollution, uh, internal environmental environment policies as well, such as for us it's printing less. And the firm, I bet you'll never come across another organisation that has as much paper as a law firm does. Um, but also, you know, physical side of things, uh, working in the office versus working from home and the energy and space in there. But also recently I attended a talk uh, that User Vision hosted around the environmental impact of data and technology, um, which the video is available actually on the User Vision YouTube channel if you want to check that out. But there's some really interesting things to be aware of to make sure that we don't cause more cha challenge by trying to cost save through technology and online systems. Anyway, that's just a taste of what the BA may cover. Let's have a look at the UX side of things. Okay, thank you, Sarah. So what is user experience? It uh, has evolved over, over time. Even the term user experience has become much more in vogue in the past uh, 12 years or so than, than before. We can call it the overall experience satisfaction a user has from, from using a system or even considering anticipating using the system because that's you interpreting it, you imagining it. So it's, uh, you know, it's this, you can drill down into it. There's been various deconstructions of the world of user experience. I, I like to think of it as, you know, three core fields. It needs to be useful. Whatever this thing is, this solution is, it needs to be meeting a certain need for people. So it has to be at the fundamental level, it has to be useful. The whole cut and thrust of using it needs to be usable, you know, see your calls to action and feedback and all of that kind of stuff. But ideally, we want it to go beyond that and be engaging and make you want to use it and actually even enjoy using it. So you can break it down into a little bit more detail on that. I think a really good breakdown is by Peter Morville, um, the honeycomb method. And you can sort of attribute these different elements to that, You know, making sure that it's usable, it's valuable, it's adding to my life. It's usable, you can find information. It's uh, you know, it's, it's usable in, in that sense. It's accessible, which is another whole world for people with disabilities as, as well, and engaging. It, it's it's kind of, you know, if not fun to use, it's not unpleasant to use. Also, trust in its has good credibility. So that's a sort of a breakdown, a quick breakdown about what user experience is. And one thing I'd, I'd like to point out, and this maybe is a sign of its evolution, is it the UX is not UI. This comes from a website, I think it's just uxisnotui.com, um, where they go great lengths to point out that user experience is not just the interface that you're, you know, that you're looking at and interacting with. It's a wider set of things to be done in the world as a UX professional that can be done, but it's also thinking about that user experience beyond just that, that interface. Um, it's really the end-to-end -end kind of experience. So there's a lot of almost kind of philosophical debate that can go on about what is user experience versus other things. We've got related terms such as service design and customer experience, et cetera. And there's, there's plenty to talk about and people like talking about that. Um, it's also good to bear in mind, what are all the benefits to, to user experience? There's lots of them and you'll have specific ones for your own business. Um, uh, having you know, faster uptake adoption of, of tools, um, you know, cost savings, time savings, actually even making a better process for creating your solution. Reduced training and support is needed. So once it's launched, perhaps you need less uh, support for the end users. 
um, if you think of things like a call center or something like that, it'd be much better to have one that's built around their, their needs. Um, and having users return time and time again, conversion rates, that's the whole world of e-commerce. It becomes usability and user experience have uh, real benefits, direct benefits there. Now, these worlds of UX and, and business analysis, you can see them interacting. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to use the word collide because that might sound too confrontational, but they, they necessarily have to interact. Let's just pick a context, one that you probably haven't needed to interact with personally in the past year, but it will happen again. We will start to fly and all this again. We will fly again. Um, and if you just look at that context, we've all been customers on, on airlines going through airports. And if you look at the main entities in that case uh, of, you know, you take the airline and then the, the airport and the through line for all that is the customer. They're going through the airport to get onto an airplane. So they have their expectations. And, and then, can I just ask, I think someone is typing um, and it's coming through on the audio. Would, if you are, would you mind, um, you know, stay with us, but just maybe put yourself on, on mute. That would be great. Um, so the, if you look at the users, sort of the through line through that, then let's consider what are, the, what are the pressures? What do these main entities want? Well, if you're an airline, nothing is better than having people waiting at the gate, ready to go an hour before the flight, something like that. You're not going to have any delayed flight delays while you're trying to search out these stray customers. So they would love to have the notification, you know, show up at this gate, you know, we're starting to board now about an hour before the flight goes so that they can get all their needs of getting their need is I need to get my customers onto my, my passengers onto my flight. What about the airport? Well, they've got a real desire to get people sticking around in the shopping area. So they say, let's, you know, stay out there, stay shopping. Okay, last minute, all right, go to your gate and, and go catch your flight. So with these two main entities, you've got a fundamental tension just around this one point of when are you going to go to the gate? There needs to be a single version of the truth put up on the monitors and your apps, etc. But uh, who's actually deciding that? And there's a lot of discussion about that. Both these entities will have their armies of uh, BAs kind of helping to, to, to sort of fight their corner in the processes that underlie this. And don't forget about all the uh, suppliers, you know, whether it's cleaners, carers, and all these other people that are, that are involved. The user is kind of navigating through this. And in a way, you can see them as, you know, having their experience uh, you know, and, and their experience is not usually, you know, not necessarily always front of mind uh, to the BAs that, that, are, that are, you know, going throughout all this process. So that's just one quick example from one particular context. But, and you can probably translate that into your own and, and start to think about, are there any tensions? And, you know, this is kind of going back to the pulling of the rope in opposite directions. Both these worlds are evolving of UX and business analysis. And I think that's what's really what allows us to start to see opportunities. So uh, Sarah is going to tell us a bit about how our, our world might uh, oh, I put collide on there. Sarah? Oh, sorry, thank you. I took myself off mute in case I accidentally made a noise. Um, yeah, so we've, we've named a couple of terms and terminologies and definitions here. There is actually ISO standards around usability and user experience. Um, but, you know, where the business analysis analyst will come up with what the system needs to be able to do, the usability um, analysis or the usability analysis part of it will look at can they actually use the system to do what they need to do. So looking at the, what the goals are, how effective and efficient that is and how satisfying the experience is. Similarly, to broaden that further, you've got the user experience, which is will they actually use the system? So, it, you know, there is from the e-commerce side, it's will they come back and return the service time and time again? Um, similarly, though, if it's an internal tool, we've, we've, for those of you who have replaced or used technologies within the system to support a business process, you may often find that if the tool wasn't um, engaging or suitable for the users to use, that they will do all kinds of horrific workarounds to avoid using that tool. So it's looking at the full holistic experience as well as not just like, can they use the tool to do what they need to do? Um, yeah, so we ideally, the great little star in the middle of that Venn diagram there, so ideally we're try and hit that sweet spot if we brought all these disciplines together to ideally deliver the, the best possible solution for the, the users and the business. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think the world is evolving. It's probably a good thing. Um, hopefully we're evolving out of the current situation we're, we're in at the moment. But if we look at the kind of 
expectations is, I think, a very important thing to, to think about. Um, services are often created from the inside out, where if you consider the inside as the sort of the, the technical gubbins that, that's in there, the systems, the procedures, and the touch points, and as a, okay, those touch points need to be interacted with, and that is when it turns into that interaction from a human, that becomes that human's experience. So if you look at that, there are a lot of systems that are, are created, and the people's experiences, in a way, you can look at it almost as a consequence of that. Okay, we've had built this system, it did need to have some kind of an interface, and well, the user's having their experience with that, that system, and that's, well, that's just the way it is. Well, the way it is has changed, at least the expectation of how it should be has, has changed. You, you've probably heard of uh, terms such as, you know, the experience economy and stuff about 20 years ago raised that profile of like, what if we flipped it on its head and we actually started saying, well, let's start with the user's experience. What would be their ideal experience and work back towards that and see what kind of systems are needed to, to actually support that? Isn't that a novel idea? In a way, maybe subconsciously, I think we've started to get used to that. We see a good experience in one area, maybe with your, I don't know, your iPhone, and then you start to maybe expect that, gosh, it'd be good if my systems here at work kind of worked like that as well. And people starting to demand that. So this experience-led design or user-centered design, if the users want a good experience, is another way to look at it. And so rather than the systems being the driver of it, they're, the, they're almost the consequence of what we want as a good, as a good experience in a way. Um, so this is a you know, an idea that I think pervades and underpins a lot of the drive and the demand for more user experience. If we use that sort of stack as a model, let's look again at our two professions. I think it's the traditional sort of domain of the usability and UX people to go back to be looking at what is what's the cut and thrust of using that system. You know, where's the buttons to push and what's my feedback, et cetera. You know, I talked about way back when we used to call it human computer interaction, which is really trying to, yeah, that's that's really what it was all about. Is like, hey, can you see the buttons? What's the size of the fonts and the spacing of these things and all of that? And that's really considering that end of that that stack. We're thinking of the experiences and interactions and touch points, and that, that was kind of the traditional role of, of user experience in many ways, not exclusively. I know there's always been sort of system and behavioral type of things, but Meanwhile, I'd say the traditional role of business analysis has been oriented towards the other way. It's, we've got these systems. How do we actually make these systems support those user needs? No, sorry, support the business needs. That's, uh, apologies. Um, those systems are primarily there to help deliver the, the efficiencies, the benefits, the, you know, the, the, the service delivery of the, the business. And those, that's going to be our North Star here. Let's make sure we have procedures that uh, enact these, these systems. And of course, they're going to have to have touch points. But at that stage, you know, the, the role of the BA becomes a bit less prominent, perhaps, in the traditional again. But things have evolved, and certainly in the world of UX, um, whether we call it user experience, once we start talking about service design and customer experience, that is implying a great ambition of being very much end-to-end. -end. And actually, you know what, we're going to have something to say about the systems and the procedures. We're not just talking about the interactions and the buttons nowadays. We're talking about the whole end-to-end -end journey. And that might have something to say about the systems. Meanwhile, BAs are actually, whether they're choosing it or not, are often having a bit of responsibility for these interactions and experiences as well, being put onto their broad shoulders. Uh, as I see, the BAs have a lot to do with um, curating, managing um, requirements, functional, non-functional requirements. And on that very busy menu of things to do is on their shoulders is saying, well, while you're doing that, could you also make sure that the user experience is being taken care of as well? And we're actually, I'm getting a lot of on certain training courses, uh, a lot of BAs coming up and saying, I'm kind of being given this responsibility of the user experience and I need to start learning more about it. What's this all about? So whether by accident or design, a lot of BAs are being given the responsibility of more of that end-to-end. -end. So clearly we're getting, at least clearly in my view, we're getting a lot more overlap between these, what were a bit more removed and separate kind of, uh, separate kind of worlds. Sarah? Cool. Um, often I'm finding the need to distinguish the two roles between business analysis and user experience, so usability analysis, um, in a really simplistic way to my stakeholders. So often I define it similar to what Chris was just touching on with the uh, with the traditional involving models, is that business analysis ensures we have the functionality and processes we need in a solution to help us perform our tasks or do our jobs. Similarly, UX will 
build upon that and look at the ability to use the functionality and the solution and the way that it needs to be used to help perform tasks and jobs. Mm -hmm. So taking that on board, um, you need to understand the users and potentially their context of use here. So there's a number of different uh, activities that you can do to this, do to, to achieve this. Um, but it's important for both roles to understand who the users are and what the context of use is. So we both use similar activities to derive different information. Here I've called out some examples of these activities where we've got observation, um, which is similar to, uh, to the shadowing skill set that we would uh, do as BAs potentially. But the, the information that we would derive from these scenarios is slightly different. So a UX person may look at the actual environment as a whole, like what the situation, what the setting is of the person. Are they sat next to a window, for example? Um, what, what artifacts they have on their desks, as well as actually how they're physically engaging with the solution and what their kind of reactions are towards that, as well as any challenges and actually achieving and completing the tasks. Whereas the BA may focus more on the actual, what are the actual, what are the tasks they're trying to complete? What actions, what information they're trying to input? And you know what are the why are they doing the what they're doing why 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 do they need to do the tasks in the way that they're doing them? Interview side of things, both are favourites of both parties is a good way to delve in deep into the clear into the understanding of what um, the problem is and potentially some of the other issues. Um, UX may focus on behaviours, drivers, and blockers in this space. The BA may look at more what the kind of key factual aspects are with regards to um, what they're trying to do and how they're going about doing it. Focus groups, not so much something that the BAs necessarily would do, but more we do workshops as a way to gather a vast quantity of requirements um, from key stakeholders in, a, in, a, in the shortest possible time. Um, the, both, the main key point with both these though is that recruitment and moderation is key. You need to make sure you've got the right people in the room to get the most value out of the, the time that you have with them, but also you need to moderate them carefully to ensure that all voices are heard equally and that you have a balanced view of what you're getting out of it. Surveys, we both use these uh, as quantitative rather than qualitative uh, type analysis, typically. It's, um, again, depending on what you're trying to get out of the survey or what, and how the um, how you structure the, sur the survey to get those answers will change depending, um, depending on what the angle is. And diary studies are something that you can use for people to, um, time and motion studies, potentially from a BA side of things way that you can get people to track um, observations in their own time, um, especially in spaces where you can't be with them over a long period of time, for example, to observe. Um, there are apps which actually the UX space has to support this, so capturing screenshots, little voice notes, um, typing notes, anything to kind of feedback that information. But as always, it needs to be constantly monitored and, and prompted to ensure that they're doing what they need to be able to do. Just. Okay, so now that we've understood that what the users want or what the problem is, and what we need to do, do next with that information is important too. So it's probably worth having a quick look at how the design life cycle can differ between user-centered design and traditional methodologies like Waterfall. With UCD, it's, which is similar to Agile, you plan, research, define features, build and evaluate, repeating until you have something which meets the user needs. This model supports regular incremental changes. This is different to methodologies like Waterfall, which are more rigid and less forgiving of the need for change. For example, at my organization, at the MVP for when you are quite, is quite extensive for applications that we're replacing. So it doesn't really tend to lend itself to agile development very well. Though that's not to say we can't flex some of the stages to incorporate the same activities. Let me run you through how, in my experience, the two roles can coexist and support each other in each stage of the linear project lifecycle I've outlined to the right. Okay, the diagram, this diagram calls out some examples of BA UA activities which may place may take place at each stage in the project life cycle. So at the scoping stage, again, we're thinking about how we consider viewing the same thing with different lenses to build the full picture of what's required, such as understanding business objectives and risks, identifying challenges with pre-existing solutions, maybe by gap analysis or usability testing, identifying and researching the stakeholders, and participating in vendor selection, especially when you use doing off the shelf selection. For the requirement solicitation phase, um, business, functional, non-functional system and user requirements are documented. While user requirements could form their own select section of the, in the catalog, some user requirements still sit quite comfortably in the non-functional space, but could also drive functional requirements. Process mapping for both key business process stages and key touch point maps, which I also call a physical walkthrough, ensure that the full picture is understood and defined. 
I've lost track of the amount of requirements I've documented off the back of asking the question. So what do the users see or do next or how will they physically get there? At the requirements validation phase, there we go. Um, I spoke recently at a VA open mic night about the value of using pictures, prototypes or wireframes or however you like to label them as a very effective means of confirming with all the stakeholders the requirements. Both parties can clearly see that they have been understood and the way the solution specs have been interpreted in a tangible sense. I call this seeing the same picture in our heads, which usually helps preempt the that's not what I imagine statement that we've all heard of the end on product delivery. Um, of course, all this is achieved before the line of code is written or a contract is signed, so there is a financial incentive there for the business. I usually like to engage with the developers too at the stage before I present any designs or wireframes to the stakeholders, as often we are restricted by what platform the tool is built in, so it pays not to present a design which won't be physically possible to deliver as the solution. At the solution validation phase, um, this stage you may do sanity checks of the design to ensure that it has, does what it's been asked. Equally, you may conduct usability testing if you see the way it delivers, to see the way it delivers the features as fit for purpose. This is one area this methodology may flex to accommodate some change in the design. By validating it at this stage, you can significantly reduce the cost both technically and reputationally of your solution before it goes live. At the test prep and support phase, for, for off-the-shelf applications, I'm often brought in after the tool has been configured to give an expert assessment against key UX heuristics of which the output will feed into the training materials and change management plan. Often at this stage, little can be done to resolve UX issues, but they can be managed through change or flagged for resolution at a later date. Review of the test scripts by both parties ensures that the right coverage will be achieved, even for risk-based testing. Likewise, reviewing the defects to see if they are a result of a technical failure or a design failure will help define the appropriate resolution for the issue. At the go-live support phase, we will both call out areas which are likely to be problematic and acquire extra attention in the training materials. Similarly, we'll cover what types of questions are likely to be raised on support calls and how they should be addressed. Back to you, Chris. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Sarah. Well, if we go back to, I guess, the world of user-centered design and user experience, it's or my, my area, let's look at this, this process, the human-centered design or user-centered design process is, if, uh, is symbolized by this or, or represented by this. And if any of you have been on uh, any training courses, we often will show this as sort of the ideal process to be, to be following, a very well-founded well one. And I'm not gonna go through the whole process, but I'm just gonna focus in on one particular one. Um, and this one's about specifying the user requirements. I think it's interesting. Usually, in my view, again, very simplistic view of what a BA is. I'm not a business analyst myself, but I always imagine that, you know, BAs kind of their ears perk up and they, hey, requirements. Are we talking requirements? That's my that's my job. And, and in many ways, I think it is. That is a fundamental uh, entity in the world of business analysis. So what are we doing? We're specifying user requirements. Well, what's that all about? Um, really in its simplest way, it's actually taking what we've learned from doing research with the users. That's what that previous stage, we're understanding the user, their tasks and all these kinds of things, interviews and all sorts of things, learning loads of stuff. And then we're saying, right, what does this actually mean for the solution? That's essentially what you're doing here. You're trying to get yourself ready to say, we've learned a lot about our users. What does this mean for our solution? And that's what these user requirements are. It's a funny term because those user requirements are actually not these are the requirements of the user. We actually have some, you know, these are the, actually the requirements of the solution to meet the needs of the user. You're kind of saying, we've learned about the user. Let's have a, that's great. We've learned the stuff. Now let's have a look at our solution. What does this that we've learned about our users mean for our solution? That's essentially what you're, we're trying to do. And actually set yourself some goals. You're trying to say, here's what our solution needs to do to meet those, those users. And then trying to stay true to that as much as possible throughout the rest of the process. And another way to look at it, and flipping it somewhat on its side, but I find this a really useful um, way to look at it, uh, is to, to look at it as, a, as, in a way, a stack that starts off at the bottom with, let's research our users. We're going to do all sorts of interesting user research things, interviews, observations. We're going to identify user needs, however we you, know, you want to define that. It's, we're going to call that user needs. What are their tasks? Where are they doing it? How do they currently do it in technology they use currently? What's good and not so good about that? We're learning a lot of stuff. And then from that, we're understanding their user needs. And 
we can document them. It's a good idea to actually get this stuff in black and white and get some consensus. So from analyzing that research data, we start to understand what do these user needs? What do the users need to either do or decide to perform their tasks at the most essential level? We aren't gonna complicate how and what technology they use. This is what they need to do, okay? Then we can start thinking, right, what about our solution? How should our solution support this? Now that we have a clear idea of these user needs, well, let's build on that. These user needs can become the basis for the requirements. And here's where, you know, I always imagine the BA's ears perk up requirements, requirements for the solution. Well, yeah, they are. These are the requirements of the user. Okay, it's not saying it's the only requirements to be considered, but the user has certain requirements, which we've established quite clearly. And you know what, some of those user requirements are going to have an implication on your system. So that's your system requirements as a result of, of those user requirements. Well, because the users want things in this in this order or in this presentation or the then we that could have a knock on effect to our system. So that's our requirements for the solution we're talking. And let's refine that. Let's move on and refine that solution, design that solution, bring in some innovation based on these requirements. Come up with some good solutions. Maybe there's different ways to do it. Those, those user requirements can become the basis for designing the solution, the whole interaction design. Maybe it's not going to be a physical. Maybe it's going to be an audio <coughs> interaction. Um, and then that can have a knock-on effect to the technical system, and as well as the other system requirements. And you can have discussions about whether we buy it off the shelf or you know, bespoke solutions and things like that. But that's another way to, to look at this. And I'll just point out at this point, if this is the kind of thing that catches your interest, I'll just do a little pointer to next month, I think on the 29th of April, we'll let you know we're having a talk by a person who is largely responsible for creating this or introducing me to this model, Thomas Geis. And um, I, I actually really like this because I think it's a great, great summary of how um, it shows the, 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 the part that uh, user research has in this in designing the solution. And Thomas will have a lot more to be saying about that, as well as, as this, this whole world of stakeholders. That's the other operative word in the world of BAs. You know, we li listen to the stakeholders and we find out our requirements. Let's call them system requirements. And that's a lot of, in a simple way, what, if we can simplify business analysis, what they do. We listen to these stakeholders. What are these stakeholder requirements and turn them into system requirements? Let's just be aware that there's lots of different types of stakeholders and they could have different requirements. That's really what I just want to point out here. And you could see them in a way, almost like a nested way. First of all, the users are a stakeholder. That sometimes not typical parlance of a business. They think stakeholders are the business itself. Actually, the users, the direct users are a stakeholder. They've got a real interest in that system. So whether that's you getting money out of a cash point machine or someone uh, you know, using a, a call center, you know, an, an operative in your call center, those are the direct users. And those, they will have their own requirements for doing what they want to do, their job or, or their task. So those user requirements definitely deserve a part in that system requirements. The indirect users are really those that are not using the system per se, but the outputs from it, sort of the, the knock-on effect, the outputs from that system, they definitely have something to do with that, that um, system requirements as well. There's the organization itself, you know, how they've traditionally done it. Uh, you know, they'll have their own preferences or, or you know, consistency reasons for, for having things certain, certain ways. So that's going to be feeding into your system requirements. Then there's the, the buyer of the of the decision maker, because the user is not necessarily always the decision maker for buying something, you know, for buying an enterprise system, they don't decide on it themselves. So those could be, let's call that the market requirements. And then as always, there's the, the legal side to it. Legislators, uh, you know, the legal side will have a part to play, whether that's health and safety um, aspects, um, there's uh, financial, financial uh, uh, aspects to it, that always has a part. So all of these will have their own play into the, into the world of the system requirements. But you can see there that the direct users have are, you know, valid, valid contributors to that system requirements. Okay, so let's wrap up. We said we talk about what, are, now that we've set the table with what about users and, um, you, know, you know, how can they actually work together? That's really what we were trying to, to get to. Um, how can BAs and UX teams work better together? And Sarah and I had a few thoughts on this. So, Sarah. Well, thanks, Chris. Um, the best teams will uh, enable and encourage close collaboration between BA and UX through activities and outputs. So you've probably heard quite a lot of information about UX and BA by now, which I hope you think all sounds great and makes sense. However, I'm sure you're wondering, so where do I start? 
So looking at the first point there, Chris. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's a builder's slide, Chris. Um, <laughs> um, so take a look at the, uh, the current status. Um, so have a look at, you know, the actual resource, the roles themselves and understand where the responsibilities and the outputs lie and understand if there's any overlaps. Then look at obviously the activities that you conduct and the deliverables that you produce off the back of that. And again, are there any gaps? Um, what could you do in a collaborative, unified way? How can you bring it all together? How can you bring it all together and work most efficiently as well? Because obviously there's always the challenge of time to get what needs to be done done to deliver the desired output. And then meet and exchange. Um, you know, it's always good to do, to knowledge share and to help upskill both both parties. So um, we do this regularly in my in my team. We do show and tells about what we've been working on and any things that are of interest. This helps people understand like firsthand what it is that you're actually doing and understand where your knowledge um, expertise was, resides, certainly because the scope of, of projects and, and functions that we support in my organization are so diverse that we often have people who tend to sort of specialize based on the project they've worked on, whether in a finance way or a, or a marketing way or even just HR, whatever that might be capacity. Um, and so it's really helpful to sort of hear that so that you call on each other just in an instinctive way and, and collaborate naturally together when you understand better about how each other operates. So these show and tells are just that much more impactful way than just telling someone this is what I do. They really do learn better from seeing what it is that you do. Um, so where you can do that kind of skill sharing cross training is going to be a huge win. And then once you've kind of worked out how you may want to work together or shape the model and how you engage with each other and how you should be called upon as resources yourselves. Um, bring, try it out in a small project if you don't already work together or try just for this new way of working that you may have try, want to try and define. Um, start with a small project before you start biting off those uh, the meaty high profile projects and get all those kinks worked out. Mm -hmm. um, so next slide there please Chris. Um, so there's many activities that are available that you could consider collaborating on. Consider your own organisation and which activities that you do. Look at how each of you may approach the same activity or make use of its outputs and see how you can collaborate to deliver what is best for the organization's operating model. Obviously, not all of those activities will be possible for every project. But for example, you may take looking at personas, you may take a template which the user, the user experience person has pulled together and then both of you between you can elicit and feed into the detail of that persona catalog. Um, both, both parties will have equally valuable views and information that needs to be considered and consolidated that way. And you could use that information to help with stakeholder buy-in as to why you are proposing what you're doing. Um, and also, you know, perform, formulate part of the doc requirements that you document, or also the way that you design your prototype UI. Now, Chris is going to expand on the UX version of a swim lane diagram, which is also which is known as a service blueprint in the UX world. And he's also going to look at some user story mapping, which is similar in structure to the Kanban boards that we often see in the BA world. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Saying the word service, I know that I've been talking about systems quite a bit with that whole stack of requirements feeding into the system requirements. You can replace that word system with service. Uh, it doesn't need to be really bounded on a system like a set of uh, desktop software or anything like that. It, it, it's, it's synonymous in that case. You could have used the word you know, uh, service requirements because all of those things from the direct user to the legal and everything in between have their implications on that. Um, so the, the two are, are in a way, synonymous. That service could have some technical and some system uh, components, but it could have some very much non-system components, that part of the human, you know, talking to, to people, uh, the service provider as well. A great way, I, I think a good vehicle for having close collaboration between the UX and the BAs is something like the service blueprints, uh, which is a process, it's typically associated with you know, service design as a sort of a, an aspect of, of user experience design, um, where we're looking at what is the what is the service we're delivering and trying to look at it specifically from two different perspectives, sort of this above that line of visibility is more towards what the user is actually doing or seeing at least, uh, you know, they're coming in and asking for something, they're initiating a process that has to be picked up and delivered and done by the, 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 uh, the entity, the, the company, you know, a person and maybe their colleagues. And that's what's happening in the backstage actions. So this is just a very simplistic overview of what a service blueprint is. But it's a good vehicle for collaboration and working between the UX and the BA teams because it does 
involve the users very overtly above that above the line is very much what is the user up to what's their user journey what's the interactions they're getting there's quite a lot of the backstage part which might be more that traditional remit of the of the business analyst what's our business need to do to deliver this service etc um, and they're there together on one template so service blueprints um, if you're not using them already they're a great vehicle i think for that kind of collaboration that sarah was talking about um, similarly because a lot of this is done in the agile context, uh, using agile methodologies, Scrum or whatever you might be doing. Um, now, this is this is something. You know, there's there's the whole world of agile and, and, and Scrum to, to learn about. But this method that is pioneered by someone called uh, Jeff Jeff Patton, um, if you want to learn more about that, is a really good overlay and I think interplay between uh, trying to keep in mind the user journey as you are getting engaged with all of that world of agile and the whole things of backlogs and what needs to be put into sprints and all of that, which is very engaging, but it could be sometimes become um, overly caught up in the whole, uh, the, the, the goals of taking things off backlogs and putting them into sprints and kind of losing perspective of what is the user actually trying to do. So I think user story mapping in a simplest sense is a really good way to, to actually keep that there because it's showing across the way there, the stages of the customer journey. And then on top of that, you start to think, well, okay, well, for each of those stages, what are the more specific tasks? Let's break this down into a little bit more granularity. Okay, in the configuration stage, we might, we're gonna have something to do configuring on screen time. And we're gonna be looking at that in sprint two. And then we can say, you'll have a thing, a lot of things in your backlog and you can map those on there. So there's there's some some really useful methods and it's because it does draw on both the, the user journey very overtly and, the, um, and what needs to be done from the business and technology point of view to actually provide things for that user journey. And then deciding, okay, how are we gonna actually schedule these things together, put them into, you know, uh, meaningful sprints uh, that can be bundled together in, in a relevant period of time. So user storage mapping as from that long list that Sarah talked through, I think is perhaps one of the, the better ones to do. So you might want to engage on that. So that's really our our summary of, of how they, they could work together. You'll have to think it through for your own organization. Everyone's going to be different. You might have a lot more BAs than UXers or vice versa, and you'll have to think it through. But in summary, really, to wrap it up, I see that the worlds of UX and business analysis are naturally, should be natural allies, and they, they should be converging through a common interest in the user needs, uh, as, as we showed earlier. And users have a natural affinity to, to the, this topic. And you know, user experience people, I think, and business analysis organizations or professionals should be working together in this way. Um, there might be some activities that are more commonly done by one party than the other, but just to kind of show it in a in a representative way, they, as you can tell, I come from America where there's candy, I don't know if you have it here, called Reese's, where they used to have these commercials where someone's walking down the street eating chocolate, someone else eating peanut butter, bizarrely, they bump into each other and they, guess what, they find out that the mixture of the two is absolutely fantastic, so great that they've launched the whole candy brand around it. Um, and it's, that's the way I kind of think of UX and BA. They don't have to be tugging at the two ends of the ropes. It doesn't have to be an awkward conversation with someone about, well, you see, this is why we have to do this with a loan application. You know, uh, you know we, we, we trump that uh, UX part to it. They ideally should be working together. How you actually do that in your own organization, I think, is for you to be, you know, take forward. Hopefully, we've given you a few ideas here um, on, on how to, to do that. Sarah? Thanks, Chris. Um, so yeah, we've kind of covered off how, how all the roles intersect and overview, and I hope we've given you a good high level illustration in the ways in which the two roles intersect and overlap in that respect. And I've given you some things to consider for your own organisations. In the last 12 months, we've become more aware than ever of the importance of the user's expectation of a good UX for a solution or service and how it impacts the survival of a business. In this world, user-centred design will drive greater successes with your products and services. So should be considered as a critical to the design, just as the business requirements are for defining the business offering. This may include expanding the traditional BA requirements catalog to include user requirements facet, but look at how they can be written into agile requirement formats. And finally, some considerations for your organization looking at both roles as they stand today. Has the business analyst, analyst's role changed with regard to end users? You know, have, have you seen already that you're naturally organically expanding based on the expectations of, of your of your business's audience and customer base? 
How can UX and BA effectively, actively and effectively collaborate in your organisation? So how can you work together to enhance each other's offering and support each other, building on whatever each of you delivers and analyzes? And how can you effectively demonstrate the business value of user requirements? I've put this one in here because this is a big challenge that I've faced as I've tried to mature the UX offering within our organization. And I think it's hard, it's hard to put something, a cost or money, monetary value on something that's intangible, but then the same way that BA considers reputational risks when they're assessing and doing analysis one must consider how the UX will actually support or prevent or reduce those risks. So there can potentially be some values that are added to that. Um, thank you. I want to thank you all for taking the time to listen today. Um, I, as I said, it's been very high level. We've only had an hour. There's definitely not a lot of depth. Um, if you want to know more about BA, I can put you in touch with some people who can explain things about the BA world to you. Equally, if you want to learn more in depth about the UX or some of the ideas said here, Chris can talk to that. I think Chris is just going to show, give you a bit of a wrap up on some key training offerings. Yeah, well, just to wrap up, we're going to have some questions and answers. I've got a few things there in the comments and uh, we can perhaps unmute you and you can verbally ask your questions, but I think I see a couple in there. Before I do that, just a quick notice about a, a few things, some upcoming events. Um, and I'm going to start off with the one that's at the uh, the, the bottom of that stack, our next briefing, similar to today, is actually on the 29th of April, and I mentioned that it's by Thomas Geis, and it's about applying that user requirements for innovative products. How do we actually use those user requirements and actually spur some innovation? It's a very uh, interesting area that Thomas is a, is a master of. If you're interested in that, please do join us. It's Again, it's going to be free. You can point to your phones at that uh, and it should hopefully bring up a uh, QR code thing to, to, to take you straight there to sign up for that. In addition, we have some training coming up. I've got one next week about all about information architecture and navigation and findability and all of that, which is important um, uh, for good user experience. We've got ones coming up on prototyping using um, Axure uh, tool. And then uh, our next uh, foundation a user experience certification course, which is the 21st to the 23rd of April. It's where you can get a certification from the UX QB, which is a qualification board, which uh, Thomas is actually president of. And uh, then the uh, web accessibility for designers coming up uh, on the 22nd of April as well. But uh, final thing I'll just say, we do these obviously for free and our charity for user vision is the Woodland Trust. We mentioned it last year off the back of Jerry, well, last year, last month, off the back of Jerry McGovern's um, talk all about uh, the eco earth experience. If you'd like to contribute to that, you have a link there and it'll come in uh, afterwards to do that. But let's hear about any of your questions that you might have. Um, because I, you know, I see, I see a few interesting comments and questions in there. This one actually, maybe Sarah, I might throw to you. I've heard of the BABOC, you know, from my little uh, introduce uh, attending of the IIBA, which is a BA big jamboree that happens uh, once, a, once a year. And there was a lot of talk about the BABOC, which is the BA book of knowledge. Okay, so, um, and someone has commented that the stakeholder requirements uh, what they are is defined as something that is derived from the business requirements. Is there some kind of flaw in this requirement classification scheme and user requirements should be taken out somehow separately? Uh, I think that's interesting that if stakeholder requirements uh, is really have to come from the business requirements. Um, Sarah, do you, would you like to talk about that? And maybe uh, the person that asked that, if you'd like to take yourself off mute, you could, um, M M Mahales, Mahales. Um, yeah, um, I don't know, Mahas, is there anything you wanted to elaborate on that? Or do you feel that the slides of what we've covered has sort of answered that at all? Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm Mikhail, uh, working as a BA in insurance industry. I'm from Latvia. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, Thanks this question was mainly about, uh, do you hear me? Yes, we can, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I got some sort of impression that uh, user requirements uh, evolved so that they start actually driving business requirements. So that my question was more about uh, subordination, which should come first, business requirements, which are uh, enterprise level, level coming from organization or user requirements. And to what extent user requirements can actually drive the business requirement? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, 
I think you can generally, as someone who wears both hats, I genuinely think you can look at it both ways. There may be a business requirement like there is, you know, for example, we I've just been working on a project where we've had the DAC 6 EU law directive around tax declar declarations and things like that. So there's been a legal requirement that my business has had to adhere to that we've had to deliver um, a system for. So I could put requirements around what we need to do to meet that legal requirement. But then I think to flip it on its head, it would be what do the, us the users need in order to support that business requirement in a way. Um, and so therefore, I agree that, that you would probably start with the business and then the user needs would feed off that to go, OK, if we're going to implement a solution in this space, this is what like, you know, they need to be able to have a tool that we can track it all in kind of thing. OK, but then how are they going to get with that? How are they going to engage with it? Does it need to be remote? Like, can they do it on a web app? Can they do it on a whatever? Um, you know, and there's all sorts of different things that you can focus in that space, but then you could think about different ways where actually there's been a user need has actually driven the technology and driven the business or created the user requirements in a way. Um, and so it's kind of, it, I think it depends on what the slant is um, there, but if you're definitely de delivering a product, which is you end user focusing, like it's an e-commerce type product, you're going to be more focused on what the user's wanting to actually achieve. Similarly, I think there was, um, is it the, what's the um, methodology, Chris, that we use, that you use about the, um, the, the card, not card sorting, the, um, the key tasks one, is it key tasks? The um, methodology where you kind of work out actually, like we had a government website that says we need to share all this information with our, with the people of the community so they can understand, you know, have all these services, tasks. all this information. Yeah. yeah. Tasks. And, yeah. And then you go and so, but then actually when they actually surveyed the actual users, they found that you only needed to see half of that information. So actually the user need of only being able to access certain information from that particular site meant that they could, the business could change and save a whole bunch of time on maintenance and costs and things like that. So actually the users needs changed the business model um, and therefore the business requirements to support what their needs were in that respect. So yeah, I think you could argue both points, but I think ultimately what we're trying to say is don't just focus on, you know, don't just focus on what the business needs or the business wants to introduce an efficiency like, you know, banks is a common one where the banks are closing down branches and moving everyone online, but they're, they're completely shutting off and disconnecting with people like elderly people and people who don't have access to internets and mobile phones and things like that to do banking and for access services or make payments. So, you know, you can't, make a business decision without understanding what the user's needs are. And if you did the research and understood, I have elderly people who don't access technology that need to pay their bills or rate, make like get loans or whatever, and they need to be able to talk to someone in a bank branch, you shouldn't be making, you know, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be making those business decisions because you understand your customer base, I suppose, in that respect. So don't know if that answers your question or if I've just confused you more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get it. There should be like two-way traffic between user requirements and business requirements. So they both yeah. connect each other. Yeah. So Ultimately, yeah. I've just come to learn you can't do one without the other now as, as wearing both hats. It's just, unfortunately, my way my thinking as well. So apologies to the business analysts, to a purists who feel I've gone more user-centric way, but I've kind of realized you can't have one without the other. Um, and it just makes everyone happy and change in business business cost of savings and things are just actually much more realized off the back of that. That's it. Um, yeah. Great. Any other questions, you know, looking at, it, I don't think, I don't see a lot of other questions. I'm aware of the time. Um, it's always estimating how much time you need to cover. This is always a approximation, there's, but there's an interest, there was an interesting point there, Chris made by Kelly. I don't know, Kelly, if you're still on the line saying it was too focused on systems, not services. Mm. I was just curious to understand how, some of the, what we were saying couldn't be applied to cert systems as well, potentially, um, and where there were some gaps and how we can help clarify that. Uh, well, what I mean is you focus really much more on building apps and systems. Um, I would rather, um, because that's the general go-to that a lot of books and everything. So it would be more interesting for me if you're thinking about user-centered design um, and you're talking about user-centered design that's not just about systems and mm. digital action but also about you talked about whether there's a window or things like that you know so it would make it more real for me if it was more about the look and feel about not just about a system or technology but also um the product um whether that's something for example i'd love to see user-centered design on something used like uh designing a hospital ward or something like that um yeah. 
be better to see an example for me how it could be applied to something that's not just tech because mm -hmm. that's full CBAs and user centered design people are is just tech and I want to get that um that focus away from us is that we're not just about tech we we do yeah. That's yeah. a really fair comment. And I think we'll definitely look to focus on that with our examples because I can already think of ways like using personas to understand who the users are. And like I do this work when I'm actually dealing, I'm built helping design our new building and I'm looking at the user journeys and how people are engaging with moving through the systems. Like you're talking about building a ward, a hospital ward. I'm effectively helping design how our new business is going to operate and function in a design level of the business as well as engaging with the technologies that support along the way. Um, and I'm using personas, I'm using mapping, I'm using um, storyboarding, which is like cartoons that show the journey and, and the engagements with touch points and things like that to help make it more realistic. So um, that's really helpful feedback from my point of view. Um, so I think we'll, I'll look to include some more examples to showcase that side of the work that I do um, than um, just the system side. So I really appreciate that. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, and I, I think you know, it's a fair point. I think uh, the interpretation of what we mean by the word system uh, probably has a part to play in it. The word system, it does maybe on one level, we see it as a system is a bunch of technology and you might picture a machine with gears and that's a system. But the system is really that whole system of the interplay of the user, the, you know, uh, let's call it of the various types of users and you know, to perform their tasks. They're going through a system. So you could think of hospital, hospital wards, there is a system for uh, you know, intaking and initial diagnosing and all of these kinds of things. That's part of a system. Yeah, and absolutely. I mean, you've got a system, systems thinking that you can apply um, exactly where uh, you see something as a, a whole system, but that's not your examples that you give there. It totally no, does right. across sure. applications. Yeah, 100% right. right. right, Kelly. No, I really yeah. appreciate that. Thank Good. you. We'll make sure we do that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, anything else you wanted to know, Kelly, while you've got the hot seat? Or are you no, no, that's okay fine. Fine, thank Roger. you. Cool. Great. Okay, any other questions? Just scrolling through the, the chat there and, um, you know, any other thoughts or questions? Otherwise we can, can wrap up on, on this. How are, we, how are we gonna make these slides available? We are gonna make them available. How are they gonna be available to people? Right, so uh, we have a slide share, um, a slide share channel. So I think, you know, after this, you'll be getting a feedback form. It'd be great to, to get your feedback on this and also to hear about other topics. We're always trying to find new topics to be talking about. Um, and we'll let you know, we'll point you towards where our SlideShare channel is and our YouTube channel, where eventually in the next few days, this will this will appear um, on, on there. So both the recording and the slides. So if you want to share it with any of your colleagues, that would be great. And of course, please let us know any questions as follow-up. Does anyone have any other questions? Great. Well, thank you all very much for your time this morning. Um, I really appreciate it. I hope you found it informative and uh, perhaps we'll see you at a future event and uh, have, a very, have a very good rest of your day today. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks guys.